Welcome back, everyone, to another fantastic episode of I'm Going to Talk, and you're going to listen. Uh, I know, back to back to crappy sound quality, um, doing a bunch of computer diagnostics and stuff. So, we'll just jump into that real quick. This might be short, or it might be multiple parts, I don't know. I've got a lot of interesting things to talk about. Um, I guess I'll do house cleaning first. Uh, book 15's new book cover is up. That means the, the rebranding is almost done. Uh, iteration one of it, anyway. Well, I, don't, I lost count of how many times I've tried to rebrand this, but this one by far has been the most successful. So, lays a lot of good groundwork for doing this again and fixing fixing it up even better. Um, where to even start? I know it's been a while. Um, tried to try to upgrade my memory, and there's a lot of kind of like I, I want to say like memory scams. At some point, the branding of memory went from megahertz which has been used as far as i can remember to mega transfers which is like a cool clicky buzzword that's kind of used interchangeably with megahertz which is not the case it seems i might have talked about this in my last podcast but i thought i would be super smart and get a second pair of sticks of memory because you always buy them in pairs. I don't go into computers, crazy computer stuff for all of you. But I bought exactly the same model number off eBay, a really affordable local U.S. place. Appeared to be brand new, just like a little scuffed box. But um, I think that, you know, they had maybe done the sticker trick or something. I'm not sure where they make it look like it's new because they have ways of putting stickers back on and stuff. And um, the computer turned on just fine. Whereas the last sticks, within, you know, I couldn't even get the computer to fully boot on uh, with the sticks trying to, to harmonize with each other. I'm trying to use non computer terms. These sticks, the computer turned on, and they all started working together, you know, exactly like how they were supposed to. And I was noticing, like, a tiny bit of system instability, but it wasn't bad, and I was able to run everything that I needed to, and I had to go, I had to go for a few days. And when I came back, like, I turned the computer back on, I just noticed it was worse. And, um started running some memory tests and the first stick was bad and the second stick was bad or or at least I ran it with both sticks and at least one of the sticks was bad I took one of the sticks out the other one was bad although with that uh, that second stick the system was running better but still not perfect so I suspect I don't want to like try to run it with the other stick because I think the other stick's worse. Anyway, um, so they sold me bad memory sticks. I don't know what's wrong with them or why or if somebody farted with them or messed with them or what what the deal is, but um, I'm testing my original sticks now. I've tested them twice and they're everything's showing up fine. The other sticks showed errors on a Windows memory diagnostic tool, like, immediately. So I chose this place on purpose because they have, you know, 30-day policy. And I was hoping, like, maybe one of the sticks would be okay, but I think, I think basically, I think one of the sticks was really, 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 really bad. And one of the sticks was, like, okay. The reason why I didn't catch it right away is because... The memory seems to, like, run some stuff, like, just fine. But, like, Opera, uh, which is a web browser, 
is an insane memory hog. But if you have a more memory than you could ever do anything with, that's just fine. Um, just like running AI is like a massive memory hog. It, it the weird thing is, is it can run the AI just fine too, but like, <laughs> it's it's just always hard to believe like how much of a memory hog Opera is. And then when you tab out of something running something else, like that's when it finally blue screened on me last night, and I'd had enough. So it's like the memory's like almost okay. And I think if I wasn't like a really heavy computer user, I think I would have noticed. But um, anyway, so yeah, I'm sitting here on my phone. I was trying to think of like things to do to be productive while I reran these memory tests over and over again to make sure my memory was fine. Because, uh, you know, QA background and follow the science. And so I like to uh, make sure I'm not going insane um, doing my due diligence. I might still check the other memory stick. But uh, just just because I'm interested, plus, like, this is a good opportunity for me to learn how to uh, make my own event logs in Windows and stuff. So it's all, it's all a learning experience. I just wish it wasn't happening right now. But it is kind of, like, rainy and cold outside because we, we had, like, four 85-degree days, and I did, wife and I did, massive amounts of gardening and fence and gate building and stuff and i've been weed whacking like crazy so uh, i definitely have a lot of things to talk about um so this is running test pass one of two eighty five percent complete overall test status 42 percent complete still no errors so my memory sticks look good i get i guess not that I think any of you are computer people, but if you're ever going to add new memory, I think my lesson learned from this, I, I still did the right thing. I would do a few things. I would have done a few additional things, though, just for extra sanity. I would have taken pictures of both of the memory sticks before I installed them in my computer. And if you have the kind of board where you already have sticks in, like, two and four, and so you're putting sticks in one and two... I would almost like take like an oil marker if if you if they've got heat shields, which these do, and I would have like written like one and three on the sticks or something. Uh, something like that. Or I would have if you don't feel safer or you can't write on the sticks, I would have kept the um keep the packaging, which you should do anyway, in case you gotta return them then write like one and three and make sure you always put one and one and three and three and put them back in the packaging exactly the same um so yeah all right topic transition numero uno all right so when we bought this place it's almost been a year i'm really excited i think we got about another month and a half and it's been about a year uh talking about homestead updates now um we told our realtor that we wanted the lawnmower, and it would have smoothed that a lot of things over, to be honest. And for some reason, m many reasons of which I'll never understand, the homeowner that sold us this place sold the mower for a lot less than what it should have gone for, instead of just leaving it with us. Um, I was I was very frustrated. And we're still feeling the impacts of that. But what I did have, and this is why you should always buy things that have multiple uses. When Ryobi batteries had been going on sale at Home Depot, we'd been buying them like in two for ones, like using gift cards and stuff, and basically accumulating Ryobi batteries just kind of for off grid projects and camping and stuff. So we'd had some four amp hours and then they had come out with the six amp hours they hadn't came out with the eight amp hours yet and we had like a traditional kind of a Ryobi weed whacker uh, which has some interesting pros and cons it has like a snap in snap out 
kind of configuration for the tools that you can plug into it. So there's like little plastic toothy blades that you can get that I actually really, really like. Or you can just like snap in a new uh, core that has the twine, has the, the twine already in it. And I really like that. And I think that has, if you just got to weed whack out your little camp because you're going camping really quick. I actually think that's great. However, part part two of that thought is that if you ever watch like those, you know, satisfying yard transformations and you see that there's a lot of times they use weed whackers there and there's there's pros and cons for weed whackers and mowers. And if you just want to make like a trail, in a lot of ways, a weed whacker is easier. Um, you don't have to worry about hitting things you don't want to hit. It's just, and it's, I don't know, it's therapy. And you get a little exercise, but not too much. So we went with, um, if you're familiar with Ryobi tools, they have kind of your standard ones. But then for just a couple of dollars more, you can get brushless, which as far as I can tell, essentially last forever because they don't have like actual motors in them, which is wild. So it shifts the weight around. It removes a lot of the like moving components. It's really interesting. So we decided, I we were using gift cards, I think anyway, and it sprung for the couple extra bucks to get the, um, the brushless. Uh, Wean Whacker, because I'm like, we're going to have to do this homestead. I'm going to have to deal with this somehow. And we still have the four and a half hours and the six amp hours. And this episode is not sponsored by Ryobi, although it would be insane if they would sponsor me. But anyway, so we had some four amp hours and some six amp hours. And I, I kind of knew we had like an old Gen 1, like Black & Decker, 24 volt or something like that, like first gen. And that's what I was using. And the, with those, those higher voltages is like, you're getting more power than 18 volt, but um, they still kind of last the same amount. Like you're lucky to weed whack for like 10 or 15 minutes. And especially in, you know, a two foot tall grass, you know, you get like, even if you're like fast charging these things, you know, it takes like 45 minutes to charge to do one big tuft of grass, which, which to be fair is actually still pretty damn helpful if you don't have the, the right mower that you need anyway. So it, it lets you mow enough to use a push mower because we have like a push mower and like an electric mower, uh, yeah. A lot of stuff that we were just able to salvage from our first house in storage it kept us going for quite a while. <clears throat> so, um, but I didn't want to burn out. Like the more I thought about it, the more I was like, if I just use like a traditional, if I keep trying to use like traditional weed whackers with motors in them and stuff, like I'm just going to burn them out on this place. This place is massive. And the grass, once it started raining, after the frosts and hail and stuff, the grass shot up to like two, three feet tall. And without a really heavy duty mower going on low for days, I wouldn't keep this place beat down. So trails, trails it is, plus trails are fun. So yeah, I'm kind of meandering to my point here, which is you can't trust the system. No, it's a uh, taxes taxation theft. No, uh, all those things are true, but those aren't the point. The point is that there are there are faster chargers than the charger I have now. The charger I have now is like a last gen charger, and I haven't timed these, even though I should. But it still takes like an hour and a half, I'd say, 
to charge like a four amp hour. And so, and each four amp hour, if you have to go through heavy brush, lasts about 15 minutes anyway, which is insane. So the 18 volt, you know, first gen, to be honest, in heavy brush wasn't doing that bad, which is insane to think about. So what, what's my real point though? My real point is that if you theoretically, in a, let's say you have a grid down, you could theoretically have enough batteries to just like weed whack all day, right? You could just weed whack all day. And you'd think to yourself, even if you had like a current gen charger, like what would you do? Just keep putting that charger on over and over again, or keep putting those batteries over and over again, right? So interestingly enough, if it's warm out, which it tends to be during the summer, which tends to be when you have solar, which is when you'd want to go off grid and that's when things traditionally try to grow because you're not be whacking out in the pouring down rain anyway. Um, you can't just throw the battery back on the charger. I don't know how the modern ones work. I mean, the current gen ones, but my last gen one, which by all, by all accounts, even though it's not the current gen of fast charger, it still charges pretty damn fast <laughs> compared to like those ones that they ship with that basically trickle charge your battery and it takes so long that it's almost irrelevant to be able to use the same day for anything. So I've been doing a lot of testing since I can burn through my two four amp hours and my two six amp hours in about an hour and a half. That doesn't sound like a lot, but that's an hour and a half of like very heavy grass. If it's not heavy grass and I'm just keeping everything trimmed down, those four amp hours actually do really, really good. Probably doubles the amount of work I can get done. So, you might think to yourself, what stops you from doing your two four amp hours, knowing that your four amp hours are going to recharge faster, and then using your two six amp hours at the end, and then waiting for your first four amp hour to charge? Because these battery chargers are supposed to be sequential. And the answer to that would be kind of twofold. First of all, it's kind of good that the Ryobi doesn't suck the battery completely dry. It'll stop working. It'll, it'll shut itself off before it kills the battery, which is kind of cool. Um, but you get basically max power all the way up until it decides to shut itself off. The thing is, is if you're drawing a battery down that fast, especially when it's sunny out, those batteries are warm. They're not hot, but they are warm with the capital W. And you can't, not only are batteries not supposed to get hot, so weed whacking out here in 100 degrees would probably really be really bad for these things. You can't really recharge them hot either because of the way the magic sauce in them works. When you're weed whacking, when you're cold out, when it's cold out but not rainy, these things do surprisingly well. You can recharge them right away. But if it's 80 out, say even 70 out, these things don't like being thrown right back on the charger. The charger will do a yellow. Yellow means it's too warm. Blinking green that's in sequence with the light on the Rayobi battery means that it's charging. And a red means it's waiting. It'll do an orange. So you might think to yourself, what 
stops you from just having a battery powered fan and blowing the battery powered fan onto the Ryobi batteries to cool them down faster. And to you, distinguished person, I would say that is an amazing idea. And I would say sometimes it works. And sometimes by the time you get done with your second six amp hour battery, so you've done two fours and your six and you threw the two fours back on right away, and you put the fan on them, sometimes your first four amp hour will be completely done and your second four amp hour will be around halfway done by the time you're done with your second six. Sometimes it completely glitches out and doesn't exactly know what it's doing. And it thinks the first battery's charged and it's not. And then it thinks the second battery does, it doesn't know what to do. It gets very confused. These sequential systems aren't perfect. In a, in a, if you, if you try to, I'm holding one up for you all to see right now. And, and to be perfectly honest, a huge part of it, that was, that was sarcasm. A huge part of it is you have to remember that it changes based on the order that you put them in. And you have to remember to actually have it insert them in into the sequential order and also insert them in in the order of how cool of a temperature they are. Because <laughs> if you insert a hot one in before a uh, cooler one, at 15 minutes, if it's 70 to 80 degrees out, is enough for it to cool down just a little bit faster if you put a battery on it. It's like 60 out right now, so they didn't need to cool down at all. They were ready. And also, if you wait to bring your batteries in and the battery's sitting in direct sunlight, the damn thing is going to get warmer instead of cooler. I don't know how the 8s work. As soon as the 8s go back on sale again and I get a few more gift cards, I'm going to check the 8s out. But also, the, I think I said this earlier, by the time you prolong use one uh, without it taking a break, it just gets warmer anyway. My friend showed me some eights, though. Glocktard, if you're out there. I think he showed me some eights, and I can't remember if those things have built-in cooling or not. Um, I know I didn't do any shout-outs at the beginning. Because I, since my computer's doing my diagnostics, I don't have my notes. So, uh, Glocktard, who's been a long since uh, sciency helper of the channel and the Bunker Codes book and stuff, uh, he's been testing Ryobi batteries probably as long as I have, if not longer. Um, and he showed me some eights, and I can't remember if those have built-in fans or not. But Ryobi, if you're out there listening, built-in fans would probably really help these things cool down faster. Man, it is crazy windy out there. Um, yeah, like all the bigger battery boxes all have multiple built-in fans, but these Ryobi's like 8 amp hours is like beef. That is a beefy battery. They should probably have built-in fans. Although I know that makes them more bulky. I don't know how you do that, but... So putting fans on them does actually help them cool down. And I also think that while they're on the charger, the charger is also keeping them warm because it's trying to pump the juice in there really fast. And so... If it's warm out and they're already having a hard time cooling down, I leave a fan on them anyway. I don't know if that helps them charge faster, 
and certainly none of this is any medical technical any advice about anything so i don't know if it would end up burning your house down but I, it definitely cools them down faster to get them to at least start charging faster and i think it helps them when they're right at the edge of that temperature to not re over rewarm themselves up as they're taking in charge i also don't know if that like lowers their lifespan so that's kind of my memory my computer memory discussion and my ryobi discussion um i'm gonna take a break and drink some water and i think i want to talk about solar panels and off-grid i have a lot of off-grid stuff on my mind so break break time mr phone blah 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 okay topic number three so survival lily which is another great youtuber <clears throat> was doing a video about panels and cutoffs and batteries and how things are different in austria where she's from talking about how their power company didn't even want to buy power from solar anymore because it wasn't cost effective because they don't really need power when solar's doing really good which is which is why you need batteries anyway she was saying i think the like 400 watt 400 watts of panels is kind of the sweet spot for off-grid and the more i think about it as a, as a video from just a day or two ago and the more i thought about it the more i was like you know what i mean obviously if you're not going for some giant you know home solution of you know seven thousand twelve thousand watts and on like directional arrays and all that which is you know you need a lot of batteries and your batteries need a lot of input anyway blah 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 point is if you just want to keep like your fridge going and your phones in your freezer you know tablets laptops phones ryobi uh, a couple things you know your security cameras you know like 400 is probably right around Right, you know, a couple a couple fans. They make fans that are like forty thousand milliamp hour batteries on like fans now, uh, which is insane. That's enough to keep a fan going for days, and you could power that with just a little ten watt panel if you wanted, which is insane. You don't you don't need to run giant box fans anymore. So, um, four hundred watts is kind of i i interpret that a couple ways like i would say you should focus on setting up a system where you could reliably get 400 coming in which frustratingly enough would probably take around 600 to 800 watts worth of panels because there's a lot of factors a lot of factors in there that can fudge up how much power comes in like if a giant maple leaf falls on your panel even if you've got really good panels um or cloud cover and all of a sudden your income your power income gets like chopped in half because of cloud cover which can very easily chop your chop your watts in half so i would focus on getting 800 watts of panels to try to get in a steady 400. That being said, if you had like a really big inverter and charge controller that can handle that, and you have like a 3000 watt battery you're still going to be like constantly topping that battery off all day, which means you're still going to want to be like during your peak load is when you're going to want to be charging everything, which kind of circles back around to the Ryobi discussion where it's like, if it takes an eternity to charge a four amp hour, which it seems like it does, it seems like it takes about 4, 
to six hours to charge like a four amp hour, which is just nuts. I would, if it was me, which it is me because it's me that I'm talking about, I would use some of my gift cards if I ever get any more, which I hope I will, to go to Home Depot and get a second battery charger, a current Gen 1, and I would maybe only use that for like the 8 amp hour ones because and then just run two of these fast chargers in parallel off of like you know a blue eddy or something that could actually handle it blue eddies the bigger batteries they do better handling bigger loads anyway um that's where they're more optimized so like it wouldn't hurt it to run like two rayobi fast chargers off of it (laughs) wouldn't even phase it and if you're bringing in 400 six 800 watts That's actually, like, barely going to be a blip on, like, your Blue Eddy, especially if you have, like, a couple of 3,000-watt batteries plugged into it. Some of you might be going, I could barely afford to put food on the table. Um, Yeah, but by now, a lot of people have been saving up and getting these, and hopefully you've been getting one that's modular. And so Blue Eddies, even the AC300s, can expand up to like 12,000 and if you're bringing in like four to 800 watts an hour you could be topping off that thing all day you can't you still can't run like your washer dryer dishwasher ac like a big ac off of it but you could run damn near everything else in the house almost indefinitely and you don't i guess kind of like part of my point is is like you don't need nearly as many panels as I thought, and after watching Survival Lily's video, I realized, like, you know, 100 watts isn't enough. Um, it could, it could keep you going, but it almost just delays the inevitable. Whereas, like, with, like, 400, 600 watts panels, meaning you're hopefully bringing in 400, uh, you could actually be doing pretty decent. It's not going to power your hot water heater or anything. It's not a full home solution. Um, I would say, again, for a full home solution, if I was doing it right, I would want an array, a directional array with like 8,000 watts. And then I would want a couple on the roofs facing south, east, and west. Well, depending on where you are and which hemisphere on the planet. So, well, this memory check is almost done and it's turning out okay. But yeah, I think, I think like 400 to 800 watts is like completely, completely doable coming in. However, sleepy. Sleepy Joe uh, finally re-put the um, the tariffs back on the Chinese uh, solar panels. So who knows? I I keep forgetting to check because I've been dealing with this memory problem. But um, I don't know how much that's affected solar. But after watching Survival Lily's video, I really want to get up. Try to get up to 400 watts of panels before I expand a bunch of, try to expand the battery situation. Just because, um, 100 100 watts would kind of like, it's like kind of like life support. Where I was like, yeah, I'm kind of rambling now. I was trying to think, basically trying to think of like, if I wanted to just like weed whack all day, to at least keep like the trails and paths and stuff instead of like having to do like an hour and a half of weed whacking and then come in and carefully manage the batteries. And then if I start in the morning by the evening, you know, I can do a little bit more, but sometimes it's like run out there when the weather's okay. So I think this kind of leads me to my next point that I'm finally trying to get at. 
Whereas if you're using a bunch of like collapsible or transportable panels, your batteries really have to be on wheels unless you have really, really long solar panel cables, which I do, but that's only for like 100 watts worth of panels, which means if you want to get southern facing sun, which is probably not where your batteries are, you still need to be able to push your batteries out somewhere where, again, where your batteries aren't warm or hot, keep them out of direct sun, keep canopies over them or something, but close enough to where your panels are being optimized, which again, you need a weed whacker to keep the grass beat down so you can set your panels up. You kind of see where I was going there. It's kind of like an ecosystem. So I have my batteries on um, a cart with wheels, but I know none of those things are cheap. Again, I got those with gift cards too, so. Um, yeah, I would have, so I would have to like push the batteries out close to the door. Oh yeah, so this is another, I have, I have blocked her to think for basically all of these ideas. Basically what I have to do is that, like slags, print, blah, 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 pretend the grid goes down. I have to push these batteries over to the fridge and freezer plug the fridge and freezer into them and then hope my cables for my solar panels are long enough to get them out to southern facing so I can start trying to bring power in and then obviously hopefully you know there's some kind of like hard enough panels to where I can the wind won't blow them away or the sun won't like destroy them which I know is counterintuitive, but the sun will destroy cheaper fabric solar panels. And then hopefully like the fridge and freezer would be offset by the solar coming in and then charge a few more things off 100 watts of panels because that's what I have now. Um, and also the batteries would be inside where it's cooler, but the panels would be an optimal optimal conditions. Interestingly though, if the power is out, the house isn't going to be cooled. And the batteries are still going to be kind of like on the southern part of the house that's going to be getting baked. Um, which again kind of is where those like battery powered fans come in because then you're at least keeping the air circulated so the batteries aren't just like sucking in hot air and killing themselves. So it's kind, of, it's kind of interesting. It's given me a lot to think about. And I still think there's a place in the world for, oh, my computer's done. I still think there's a place in the world for lithium, lithium ion. It's lighter. Um, the power is a little bit more boosty. It's a little bit more efficient for lighter loads, but the lifespan's garbage. So even though I still have my goal is zero 0,500, I'm, I'm saving it as much as I can. Um, I wish I was like garnering the power of the sun to keep these Ryobis going but I just don't have I don't want to like wheel the uh, lithium iron phosphates over to the side of the house to get the solar out um, because the side of the house that I'm on I'm on the west facing side And I would have to, it's, I know this all sounds just so goofy, but I would have to weed whack out there, kind of run them through the window, close the thermal curtains on the window. And then everyone's going to see them, which kind of goes back to optics. They're going to see that I'm weed whacking over there and that I'm setting a bunch of solar panels down. Um, now, <laughs> You might say that's laziness and stuff and that sun, sun angle and so on and so forth. So I am going to start doing that. 
as soon as we have to keep the AC on all day. I am going to start doing that. Um, I have enough weather insulation and stuff to insulate and then thermal curtain this window. And um, from there, I will uh, either run the solar panels out here or like stuff the other panel, st you know, stuff everything in the back somehow. And um, my wife came up with an amazing idea, which was get like um, a canopy and then throw the panels on top of the canopy. And I absolutely love that idea. Which is why she's the smart one. Because um, I would have never thought of that. And then the canopy can keep everything cool. Because uh, usually you want to just keep the direct sun off your batteries. So a nice big canopy, throw the panels on top, have the batteries underneath some semblance of that. Yeah, I don't know. And then the canopy gives you more surface area because you can be doing things under the canopy and the panels aren't taking up tons of space. So that's given me a lot to think about. But I'm not going to start doing a lot of that until the AC because that's when the power prices or the, the, the our power bill is going to probably quadruple. And then if I'm running power tools all summer. Every little bit would help, even though it's probably only, you know, 60 to 80 watts an hour. But if I'm running like two chargers at the same time and trying to keep all the fans charged and stuff, like I may as well just try to run as much of that off solar as possible. So that's kind of my plan. Um, yeah, kind of my plan. Well, it's kind of a bummer. Unfortunately, um, despite this thing running for an hour, it's only running like the schedule and not the results. And I really, if that, I really, blah, blah, blah. I really wonder if it's because it just doesn't show results, if it doesn't have an error. So. I'm going to pause this, I think, and I'm going to throw in memory stick number two and see if it airs out. So I'm going to take a break, and I think I'm going to have a what if I'm wrong about everything segment, because that's been on my mind a lot. All right, part part three of this thing. I, I decided since I had more podcasts to do, I'd go test the other memory stick. So the other memory stick's testing. Um before I go into the what if I was what if I'm wrong about everything segment uh, I did do some some business travel recently and uh, the airline industry is just every bit as messed up as you hear about on TV with planes falling apart and stuff I was stuck on a flight on the tarmac for an hour and a half because like a latch on an overhead bin wouldn't close. And that that BS has happened before. First of all, I don't even know if it's true or not, because whatever. Um, but I'm pretty sure that after an hour and a half on the tarmac, the bin ended up popping open again anyway, which is hilarious, whatever. So I don't know why they didn't just duct tape it, but whatever. Um, it should take an hour and a half to fix an overhead bin latch. And I don't know how they didn't know that from like the last flight. So I have a lot of questions. And uh, it took, the estimate was like 15 minutes to get like mechanics there because who the hell knows. But this is like a massive international airport. How do you not have like a mechanic that can just like come take a look at the hatches, the the overhead the overhead bin latches. It boggles my mind just how inept the airports are, how inept 
the mechanics are and the preventative maintenance and stuff and I know they I know they slam those things like crazy it's like you can't build better overhead bins this this again second time this has happened to me oh overhead bin won't close as they're sitting there just like slamming it and uh on paper you know they seem like really strong bins but I don't I don't know why they aren't built with like a mechanic a uh, mechanical element that can just like drop in and drop out just slot slot a new latch in or something and then just be on your way um, for, so first of all and then second of all why is it take an hour and a half no minimum of 15 minutes to get a mechanic and an hour and a half to fix a latch like why why not just like carry a bunch of those around in their pocket or something like good grief um hour and a half i don't even i don't even think we got an apology to be honest um this is just like it's just like the episode of south park of just how painful the airports are but but let's let's start from the beginning. Let's talk about one of my favorite favorite three letter agencies that I love so much. Let's talk about the TSA. Um, so you go there, and not only do the rules change every time you go, but they sometimes change two or three times like while you're in the line. When I used to, I used to like business travel. Um, yeah, so does Spooky. And I don't know how it got to where it is now, but it used to be, you take your you take your shoes off, uh, you take your belt off, you empty out your pockets, and then you throw everything in the bin and it gets scanned. Well, at some point with the advent of laptops. They decided, like, you could only bring two laptops on the plane, and you might, like, two laptops. What do you need two laptops? Well, usually your business and your personal laptop or whatever. It depends on what you're doing. You might be doing QA. You might need seven laptops. You never know. Tablets and phones. Um, perfect, perfect, legitimate reasons. So, um, but, you know, it should stop with, like, two laptops unless you have a reason but like you might want to bring like a handheld gaming device you want you might need two phones you might have your personal phone and your business phone uh blah 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 anyway so what you used to have to do is you used to have to um pre present evidence that your laptops worked so you used to have to get all your laptops out make sure they were all charged pray they were all charged get them all to boot up, turn them all back off again. And then you could kind of get through security that way. That, that's how it used to work. So when we got, and then, you know, your phone had to be out too, your watch had to be off, your rings had to be off. Like they used to be crazy. It used to be really crazy. So I had my laptops ready or my laptop. I made sure it was charged. I tested it before I left. Um, you know, laptop is fine. And so I had it, but I had it all tucked away and really snug and nice and safe and sound and extra padding and everything and really did my due diligence to make sure my laptop was going to be safe. And, um, got there, have my laptop out and ready to go. And they're like, oh, put your laptop away, but your phone needs to be out. And put everything in two bins, not one. Oh, no, 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 no. They said everything everything has to be in its own bin. <laughs> so I had my bag in one bin and all my stuff in the second bin. They used to have somebody just up front that would just tell you as you're basically stripping down to almost nothing to get going here in front of all your coworkers, but oh, well. Um, they didn't have anybody up front telling you what to do. So, and there was no signs of like what the instructions of the day are going to be. And so we we're all just guessing, like, what's TSA going to have us do this time? 
So I had my laptop out. They told me to put, and then we so I finally got up there. They told me to put my laptop away. They said everything to be in two bins. Or no, everything to be in its own bin. And then they said everything in two bins. And then they said everything in, in one bin. And then this, whoever was behind the, this, oh yeah. And then you jump up into this big tube thing throw your hands up in the air like you're being arrested, and then you get scanned. Don't know who's looking at what or what's going on, or if it's just some new... And it looks like you're in, like, a big double MRI. I don't actually think it's, like, a body scanner. Like, it's not taking a picture of your naked body. I think it. what it does is it does, like, a layout of where it thinks it found things and gives them a layout of where to go look for it. Um... More on that later. More on that later. And, um... The guy was just, like, looking at my bag over and over and over in the scanner and just... just staring at it. And it it almost makes me wonder if, like, it's ran by an AI now and he's just pretending to look at it while the AI sees if it found anything. Because I don't know what he was staring at, but it didn't look like he was even really staring at anything. I thought for sure they were going to make me rip my bag apart, which was probably 90% clothes. And all I could think about is like, maybe you're staring at my bag for so long because you just should have had me take the damn laptop out of it. Like, how does the scanner, because I had my laptop on the top. I'm like, how is the scanner punching through the entire laptop to look at everything else? That's crazy. Maybe it scans from the bottom. I don't know. But, did he was staring at something. And the way, and I could see what he was looking at. And it didn't even look like it was making a functionally a picture of, of anything that could be interpreted as anything. And I don't know if he was looking at my toothbrush or what, but or my little plugs. I had my plug for my laptop in there. He was staring at something for like a good minute. And I'm like, man, you get a good look at that toothbrush. Which is just, I, I don't even bring a fancy toothbrush to these things. Just to, Anyway, I don't know what the hell he was looking at. And I had like my medicine in there. And I bring some extra medicine. I don't know, that shit took forever. So, you know, and then like overhead, oh, f- food at the airport's ludicrously expensive. Um, all that, nothing that soon. But yeah, on the tarmac for an hour and a half for an overhead bin that ended up popping open anyway. So on the way back, I thought TSA is going to be the same. They have the same equipment, the same scanners, the same everything. Oh, they didn't make me take my watch off, uh, which I thought for sure they were going to make me take my watch off, but I had forgot. And they let me through. The scanner didn't even didn't even catch my they didn't make me take my glasses off either i used to have to take my glasses off and my watch off so that to me was just clown clown peak peak clown world but whatever so on the way back i remembered and i took my watch off so this time they were actually they actually said your cell phone can stay in your pocket But all your other pockets have to be empty. But I'm like, I'm not going through that damn scanner with my cell phone. So I put my cell phone in the bin. Uh, But they're like, no, your laptop has to be out. So I'm like, wait, you've got to be kidding me. My laptop has to be out now. And put everything in two bins. I'm like, okay, fine. So at least I'm not trying to jam everything into one freaking bin this time. So... Uh, I get through, and the, the the alarm for the scanner goes off. And the guy's like, do you have anything in your pockets? I'm like, I don't think so. He goes, what about your left pocket? Do you have, like, a pen in your left pocket? And I'm like, I don't... I kept patting my pocket over and over and over again. I knew I'd throw my pen in the thing, in the bin. I'm like, no, I don't think so. I'm pat- and then I remembered, I'm like, oh, I've got some Pepto... I've got, like, the last of my Pepto-Bismol... Little, the little tablets in there. 
And uh, I'm like, oh, and I tell, I'm like, yep, you're right. You're right. You got me. I had a pack of the Pepto-Bismol in here. And he's like, well, does your leg hurt? And I'm like, what do you mean? Does my leg hurt? I'm like, no. Why are you asking me if my leg hurts? He's like, well, does your leg hurt? You don't have any injuries on your leg, do you? And I'm like, no, I don't have any injuries on my leg. My leg feels fine. He's like, okay, because I got to pat you down and I don't want to hurt your leg. I'm like, I don't want you to hurt my leg. I don't want you to hurt my leg either. And then he patted my leg down and he's like, okay, you can go. And so I'm like, okay, well, I'm keeping my Pepto and I put my Pepto back in my pocket. So I thought that was really weird. Um, I don't know why two different international airports run their TSA like completely different. I would I would have thought that they all would have been standardized. And I really and I took my watch off the second time because I didn't want any problems. So I guess it, it amazes me that their scanners picked up that I had a teeny tiny teeny tiny little three pack of Pepto tablets in my pocket. So those uh, those scanners can scan, boy howdy. So I thought that was interesting. Does it make me feel any safer? No, not at all, not even a little bit. Um, and I don't I don't I don't know if I've ever had a segment of like what would make me feel safe on a plane, um, but I, I would probably preface it by saying feeling safe and being safe are two different things. And I think the only way to feel, feel safe is to just not ever fly. Uh, because I don't think it's possible if you're a sane human being with any critical thinking to actually feel safe on a plane at all. It has nothing to do with September 11th. It's just like, has to do with the status of just like jet jets and, and and pilots so landing on the way back the pilot touched one wheel down first bounced off that wheel landed on the other wheel bounced off that wheel landed on the other wheel again i forgot how scary that <laughs> i forgot how scary it is when that happens and I don't know if wind caught us at just the last second, or I don't know why they couldn't touch both wheels down at the same time, but you see your life flash before your eyes every time a pilot does that. And I'm not going to make any comments about the uh, the qualifications of the pilot, because I don't know. I don't know how to land a plane, and I don't know how hard it is to get both wheels to land at the same time. But... Um, that was the thing that happened. And then I think the most frustrating, oh, not the most, there was a lot of frustrating things. They didn't, you know, taxi us into like a proper terminal to like leave us, you know, at the proper place in the airport. And this has happened before and it always f throws me off when they make us walk back down to the tarmac and walk into like an actual terminal, walk into like the wrong part of the terminal. So you're in arrivals instead of departures. That always throws me off. So I came in completely the wrong part of the airport and promptly got lost. Um, I hate that. So, and, but I know there's not probably not a lot they can do about that. Uh, so yeah, that's my, my business travel. Nothing got lost as far as I know. Um, as far as I could tell, nothing got lost. The, uh, I think I, I want to read. Oh, careful, careful, spooky. She scared herself. I want to reiterate. I think the key to flying, having a, having a, I don't know, how do I say this? Successful flight experience that you actually survive. Uh, the key is massive amounts of patience uh, and 
the fact that you are all in that pod together, the, the metal tube of death, the life of everything. And it's incumbent on all of you to get all of you through that together. You're all like a little mini team. And I feel like if as long as everybody embraces that and there isn't any like selfish self shell shellfish jackasses on there. Which we didn't have any of those. Everybody was super chill. Um, in fact, this may have been one of the only flights, both to and from, where there wasn't somebody just being a raging jackass. Like, everybody was being ultra patient. Except for the screaming kid. But, in my opinion, you're not getting the full experience if there isn't a screaming kid on the plane. Um... And we'd been sitting on the tarmac for an hour and a half. If there hadn't have been a screaming kid, I would have thought I was in the twilight zone. So. And the kid, it's the weirdest thing. The kid had maybe had scratched himself or someone wanted a band-aid. And some gal's like, hey, here's a band-aid. Give the kid a band-aid. And the kid was like super chill the rest of the time. The second they got a band-aid. Bandage. Adhesive. Adhesive. Bandage. I thought that was cool, and I, I, in hindsight now that I'm thinking about it, it kind of surprises me that the flight stewardesses, steward, stewardess, the flight attendants, didn't just, like, grab one from the first aid kit and, like, bring it over. They were in another universe during that hour and a half, there was actually zero communication the whole time other than, hey, it's going to be 15 minutes until the mechanics get here. I'm going to do all the pre-flights now so we're ready. That was the only thing they told us the entire time. Uh, the, even like the flight attendants, I don't think, and they must have just got back off the plane and peaced out or something like this. We're going to go to sleep, come call us. Because they were just fiddle farting around, so I think that was kind of like a missed a missed opportunity for like the flight attendants to be like the heroes. And I think again that's why kind of like everybody on that metal tube has got to just accept it's like all right we're all a team now we're all a, we're all team. Let's survive this damn flight, you know. And I feel like. 99.9% of the time, humanity is really good at that. Um, it was refreshing to not have there be some douchebag on the flight that everybody wants to toss off. Um, I know I've heard of, of her, I've heard of that a lot happening lately, and I guess I guess I'm thankful that that still seems to be the exception, not the rule. However, what seems to be the, the rule and not the exception is these planes falling apart. Um, yeah, so I'm glad I ran out and did some yard work because there was like some drippy drips of rain earlier and now it's coming down, so it was good timing. All right, I'm going to take one more break. This memory, man, knock on wood, this uh, second memory stick might actually be good. That would be a good, uh, that would be a net positive outcome. All right, BRB. All right. Attempt number two. Uh, what if I got it all wrong? Oh, it's been a long day. I'd, I tried to get some things done, but... It's just a mess. Today was turning from summer to winter and summer to winter over and over again. It makes me feel like crap. My cats are crabby too. So what was I saying? Chaz zones. Um, college, college takeovers. Um, every four years. 
it always starts the same. They test the patients, you know, with bridges, overpasses, freeways. And every time there's less and less resistance, they see which cities they can go after. They probe, try a couple of small towns, try a couple big towns. I don't know how they settled on the colleges this time as their soft targets, but they tried a lot of federal buildings. They tried a lot of city. They tried everything to see what the softest target was going to be and whoever's in charge of this so-called decentralized movement. Wink, wink. This highly, highly, highly funded group of tens of thousands of people that all show up with the same tents in every city with the same signs on the same days. You know. Uh... They decided colleges were the soft targets, and they decided which cities would be the softest cities. And I'd say they got it about 80% right. A couple of cities saw it for what it was and immediately struck back. And some, uh, some conservatives said, uh, Oh, this type of this type of backlash to protesters is gonna embolden them. But they they set everything up in a way to where it's a win win for them. So if you don't have a concerted, intelligent, multi tiered immediate overwhelming law enforcement or public response they're able to get their roots in there and the optics are going to be bad no matter what they've learned that from a long time a lot a lot of practice they know that they're going to win the optics battle no matter what you can't There has, there has, it has to be a measured response, but it has to be decisive and overwhelming and effective, and there has to be follow-up and clean-up and then defense to shoo them away. Some cities did this very, very well. Some cities got about halfway there. Some cities completely failed. In some cities... Law enforcement did an amazing job in other cities in the vacuum. People took it on themselves to clean up their own areas and remove this plague. So the the context for what if I'm wrong is uh, what if everything just ends up okay? That's always what I go back to. It's like, you know, like how 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 do we get to this all being okay? And the only way to do that is to create an environment where the people who are protesting don't have something. <sighs> don't have something triggery enough you know I used to say you know I didn't know what it was going to be every four years I never know what it's going to be you know they try they try a couple different things to see what's going to be the most triggery and it ended up being the Palestine Hamas thing much to my uh, I don't know. An odd, an odd thing for them to get upset about, but it fits in line with what they like to do, which is LARP, you know, dress up, 
something that can cover their masks and or cover their faces and protect them. You know, so LARPing is Palestinians. Works really well, I suppose. It fits their criteria. And so to kind of the the Palestine thing can't really run its course like George Floyd or um, Trayvon Martin, you know, those those incidents, and there's many more, I cannot remember them all, they eventually run their course. They need, like, a, a steady stream of martyrs to keep their causes going. And so this for for them to just fizzle and go away for now and for everything to be fine the palestine problem has to go away because they don't give a shit about you uh, ukraine it's not triggering enough for them the ukraine thing so china and me dion it's today's been rough um so How, how would the Palestine uh, n- news news cycle go away? Um, you know, it would be if so they've as of as of the recording of this podcast, the pier is built. Supplies are coming in through the pier. They're still heavy fighting. the the, the memes would indicate. They're trying to get the the combative element isolated from the quote unquote innocent element. And the the there's there's so many problematic dynamics with like squashing this in the news cycle that would make the protesters fizzle, lose their triggering energy. Um, you'd have to somehow get rid of Hamas, which I don't think can happen. Uh, not with the tunnels that they've built. So you've got an unwinnable war against an ideal, uh, a, how do I want to say this? Oh, what's the word? Not a, um, I'm struggling with my words all of a sudden. The, uh, not a traditional war. Ah, yeah, conventional war. That's us. Yeah. So the problem is, you know, you've got one side fighting a conventional war, like one side fighting a third gen war, and one side fighting like a fourth gen war. You can't get rid of an ideology in a conventional war. Certainly, and they can't. They couldn't beat them in a conventional war either and you have the problem of sleepy sleepy joe saying we're not going to send you weapons anymore and then doing it anyway Um, and and again this is only one one paradigm you still have the fact that the energy grid could get nailed with cyber the fact that evs and data centers for AI are absolutely destroying the grid right now. Um, and the fact that you have food prices going up, even though the... Oh, man, what was it? As uh, the Dow Jones hit uh, 40000 for the first time ever today. Meanwhile, food prices are as high as they've ever been. Like, something... Something's going on there, too. So, not to mention you have student loan prices and a bunch of other things. Like, if they're protesting at the colleges for the student loan prices and, and the lack of the value of college, you know, very, very quickly diminishing... 
I think I think this was a critical misstep on the in the field of the protesters. I don't think uh, well, Hamas doesn't have the moral high ground anyway, and even though a lot of people have issues with certain factions of Israel, uh, what happened can't be pushed under the rug. And then you've got sort of like a Somalia, like Mogadishu situation where you've got people taking over the food aid. and So there, these, these, these festering wounds uh, and foreign entanglements and the fact that the three letters keep everybody at everybody's throat. <sighs> the fact that we're running out of money anyway and we're running out of munitions anyway. Um, this this uh, Palestine thing is not going to resolve itself. It, it could fizzle out, but for it to fizzle out, they would have to keep it out of the news cycles. And usually, unfortunately, how they do that... Don't yawn, don't yawn. Usually, how they do that is by making something even worse in the news cycle, or something super distracting. And there's a lot of organic stuff that can some, sometimes just conveniently swoop along like this, those insane, like, coronal mass ejection, whatever it did do is a week or so ago, where, I don't know, like, the whole entire world had, like, the northern lights blasting around. Our sky was red. Like a throbbing red for hours, which is nuts. Um, and, you know, we have a tree line, so we didn't see the green part. But there's things like that, you know, that could come around once in a while. or But, like, spy balloons and after, like, they, they have to find something even more gnarly to distract everybody to get Palestine off the news cycle. And that's kind of like a frightening thought. And they've never done a really good job at de-escalating this stuff. So plan plan B, you know, is to just try to keep kicking them out of all the colleges and they're just gonna go somewhere else. You know, the cities haven't done a good enough job at fortifying everything. Because they don't have enough money to. Um, this military guy I've talked to in the past basically said, like, if you're trying to defend everything, you can basically defend nothing. And when you've got thousands of unemployed people in every city that can do nothing but poke around and find weaknesses, they're going to find something and set up more chazes. And... Um, You know, universal basic income is coming. You'd think, like, maybe giving them all money again would maybe make them chill out because they'd have money to go spend and do something and it would maybe distract them. I don't know. Um, because no matter who wins the elections, they go nuts. Um, I know in Portland, the news censored it all, but most of the spray painting, um, they, they had blurred it all out, all the spray paint, but it said basically F Joe Biden. They had blurred it out, uh, but that's exactly what it said. Um, so it's the, you know, the, the election's not going to calm them down. I'm not even sure that money would calm them down anymore because, like it did during the Rona because they could just go into the store and steal whatever they want. So you can't, you can't, they can't be bought, they can't be reasoned with, they can't be bargained with. You know, big, com big tech, big companies aren't going to pull out of their military contracts ever. 
Um, the only thing that screws up military contracts is uh, legal <laughs> lawyers squabbling over if the contracts are fair or not, which does happen. Um, that's not going to stop this, though. I mean, we don't make enough shells, and then Lockheed Martin, everyone else is printing printing money with with missiles. They don't they don't want this to go away. And drones and anti drone technology. Um, I don't think a World War Three is coming because I don't think anyone has enough money or resources to fight it, except for Russia. So, give China 10 more years, though, and they could take over the whole world. But, I don't know. Uh, the whole computer chip thing. So, I just don't, I don't see a way out of this. I think one of the worst catalysts, and I keep forgetting this, has been the fact that even though there has been some inflation some inflationary pressure. All the companies are still recording record profits. And it's because they're raising their prices way, <laughs> way higher than inflation actually is. They're just using it as an excuse. Just like they're using theft as an excuse to close down underperforming stores. Meanwhile, you still have everybody in the city trying to force everyone back to the office. And um, nobody's going. You still have vehicles that are 30, 40% overpriced. And I was reading some, some tweets today. There's been so much buzz about how the fact there isn't affordable pickup trucks anymore. And it just got me thinking how many regimes have been overthrown with cheap, cheap Toyota pickup trucks. And now we're not allowed to have cheap, cheap pickup trucks here anymore. And I just, that those two pieces clicked together for me. And I wouldn't be the least bit surprised if just like modern firearms, drones, armor, radios, and a couple other things, if uh, we're not intentionally being priced out of the pickup truck market because of how effective those are at um, towns being able to defend themselves. Uh, a pickup, a pickup, uh, even even a remotely decent pickup truck is an insane force multiplier in civil unrest. Um, in the last, I'd say, six years, pickup trucks have just been absolutely saving people's asses. Now, uh, they're not invincible, just like semis aren't invincible, but massive, massive for it. You could see over the vehicles to see what the roadblocks are. They can't smash your door in and pull you out as easily. Um, they can't ram. They can't throw stuff under your vehicle and high center you as easily. So, and a lot of other things. So it's easier to just back out if you need to back out. I so I wouldn't be surprised if a huge chunk of this plan was to just make sure people couldn't just load up on forerunners and Tacomas and so on. But I would I would like to be wrong. But, like, this is, like, four years and eight years all over again. I mean, the economy, supposedly, on paper, the economy is better right now on paper than it was during Trump. <laughs> Which everybody knows is so, so much further than the truth. It couldn't be any further from the truth. But on paper... If you look at most crypto, and if you look at the Dow Jones, and you look at the stock market, and you look at big tech, and you look at everybody's revenue, 
Um, it's insanely, insanely overvalued. And a lot of that's because of AI, but most, not all, most of the AI stuff just hasn't come to fruition. Um, I had to talk to an AI on the phone the other day to reset a password. And the website had told me to call in to reset my password. And, and the AI answered. And it's like, I can, you know, I can text you and give you the instructions to reset your password. And it's like, no, you're the one that told, <laughs> it's like, your system told me to call in. I want to talk to a person. It's like, but I can give you the instructions. I'm like, I don't want the instructions. I want my password reset. And it told me to call in. <laughs> I was just, it like, if you have to talk to an AI, why can't you just talk to the AI on the website to reset your password? Why do you have to call in to talk to the AI? It doesn't make any sense. And um, so I think they're going to really, I think they're going to struggle because it's going to be really expensive to run these. And I finally convinced the AI to let me talk to a person and there was like a 15 minute hold time which tells me that everybody was having the same problem. As long as the phone quality is remotely decent and the person can like even remotely speak English, it's still better than talking to an AI. Like, AIs just don't get it. They don't get it. Like, the AI doesn't know, you know, that you were told to call it into it and now it's going to try to give you the instructions to do the thing that <laughs> it's like, I don't, I don't, and then it was like, I can text you the instructions. I'm like, nope, you already told me to call in. <laughs> I don't want the instructions texted to me because then I would have just had it do that in the first place, not have me call and talk to an AI first. So I, there's going to be a reckoning. But I think as long as people can drive Ubers around, I'm not picking on Uber, this goes for DoorDash and Lyft. And as long as people have these little second, third jobs, the economy just barely, 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 barely keeps going. People's houses and food and bills and stuff, but like the McDonald's, those are all kiosks now. Um, pretty soon everything is going to be kiosks and vending machines. Like fast food is going to be glorified vending machine. I went on business travel. Everything was double and triple price. Um, that all ends. Excuse me. That all ends as soon as um, companies' budgets run out to send people on business travel because... Nobody can afford to personally travel and spend double or triple already inflated prices. It shouldn't cost six fifty for like a tiny cup of like chai tea or like eight fifty for ice like an iced tea with no sweetener in it. <laughs> like eight fifty. Are you insane? Iced, for an iced tea with no sweetener in it like if you're not on business travel like nobody can afford that <laughs> that used to be like the most affordable thing that you could get you used to be able to get like a giant iced tea with no sweetener for like a couple bucks <laughs> so once once those travel budgets run out That'll be like the last of the the catering industry and stuff or the, the kind of holiday travel industry and all those travel travel caterer people. Like what happens when AI can just do your travel travel for you? So 
uh, I just, what if I'm wrong? I don't know. I hope so. But I don't see how. I still don't see a way out of this. I think you got to plan for your off grid. Get a couple solar panels, get a couple batteries. Start doing the math on how to keep, you know, your fridge and freezer going. I heard a lot of people go, Ugh. I'll just go without a fridge and freezer. It's like, oh, what about people on insulin? What about people with CPAPs? Um, uh, then, you know, oh, just get over-the-counter insulin. Not a lot of people can take over-the-counter insulin. Um, <laughs> it's just, oh, just go without your CPAP. Oh, okay, so try to survive the apocalypse without any sleep and... You know, your body starts getting more viruses and because it's not getting rest and you're keeping the rest of your group awake because you're, yeah. Oh, just lose weight. There's people with sleep apnea that are, that are healthy otherwise. It's just, it's tough. Like, what, what are you going to do when it's 100, 110 out and how are you going to keep your house cool? What can you do when it's freezing? Like, they're trying to get rid of wood stoves, you know? So, you know, we have a lot of work to do, but getting, you gotta get food, food, food preps and food preservation, because once this economy bubble bursts, they're going to have to switch over to digital currency and reissue, reissue everything, because if everyone loses their houses, that'll be that, and the banks can own all these houses for a while, but either someone's going to come scoop them up, or they're going to have to federalize, you know, the banks if they federalize the stock market. I don't know. I wish I was wrong. I wish I could say that everything's going to be fine, but this is all by design. So with your job, the only thing you can hope for is a recession-proof job. And I don't know what that looks like anymore. You know? You could try to repair vehicles, but they're trying to make vehicles unrepairable. You could try to work on commercial, but who knows if commercial is going to be a thing. All the industrials st still moving. Moving away. I don't know. Ag. They're trying to buy up all the agricultural land, but I don't know. A lot of, there's a lot of criticism over people that still work on software. And while big tech is massively, massively <laughs> laying off people across the board, I still think that there is a future where there's still going to be IT jobs. And they're still going to need project managers, and they're still going to need business analysts, and they're still going to need, maybe not coders, but they'll need people who can do config and write documents and stuff. I think we're ages away from AI taking that over. You can use AI to automate, but how does it... How would an AI do project management? You know, how would an AI tell you what to work on next? You know, you still have users. You still need product owners to figure out which things the users are going to want first or which thing, 
makes the most sense to prioritize. And an AI can only propose it, but it, it wouldn't have any like context or points of reference. You know, unless it had such like an astronomically giant learning model, or it could be like Google installed something like that and it installed it this way, this or way. So we, you guys should install it this or way. But like, we're so far away from that. You know, <laughs> departments are still full of employees that still have feelings and emotions and agendas and user experience preferences. And software as a service still is has to make software for be really flexible for a lot of people. So they can update it all at once without breaking something. So how do you I think you can get an AI there to be able to make software, but you still have to have somebody say, make it look like this, make it look like that. It's, it's really, I feel like if you fully gave into AI, you'd end up with like another dynamics. If any of the one, two people out there listen to me if you've ever used Microsoft Dynamics or Access or Excel, I feel like AI would just get us right back into that boat again where it's like, okay, cool. I got to go in and fix this AI software now and it made 5 billion tables. I have to sit there and untangle the 5 billion tables. Like, what do I do? Go drag it into a different AI? <laughs> tell the other AI to fix it like that would be like the job like the that'd be like the job security of like the universe like on effing all the AI f ups trying to like organize databases <laughs> like the smartest people in the world can't design decent databases right now half the time. Like you can ask like an AI to design a database. What happens when somebody has to go in and do something? <laughs> like what happens when the AI like fragments and can't find anything in its own database anymore? How do you like re-archive the whole thing? That would that just be like that would be just so insane. Like, even even in a book, I couldn't imagine if I had to write like a fictional book, how much of like an astronomical headache it would be trying to figure out how you'd have like an AI BA, an AI tech writer. Cause like you still have users. So do you have like the AI write all the tech docs too? Or is everything just like Star Trek? We're just like, hey, computer, uh, can you turn on the warp drive? And there's no manual because it's so complicated that only the AI can run it. And what if you just like wake up and the AI would be like, hey, I optimized the transporter today. <laughs> like, oh, what's that mean? It's too complicated. You want to understand? You want to transport somewhere? <laughs> Even in Star Trek, in like the dystopian, wait, utopian future of Star Trek, the AI still didn't update anything on the starship. It was all people. You still had full suites, like, because you'd never designed a ship like that. The ship's like, hey, I fixed the torpedoes today. <laughs> oh, have you tested them? Uh, I tested them in in the simulator, and they're fine. 
and I updated the simulator. We're like, wait a minute. I need you to calm down, ship. <laughs> so I, I joke about it. I could see us eventually getting there, but it's the same thing with like quantum computers. It's like we have quantum computers now. They just can't really do anything. Nothing's like written for them. And it's the same thing with AI. Like there will be, I forget what the, the fancy pants term is, but there will be a point that we reach to where it will be able to take off on its own, but it doesn't work as long as there are still users. Like, the whole point of software development revolves around user adoption. And people can just decide to not use something. Like when they got rid of contact us and replaced everything with knowledge bases. And then they replaced knowledge bases with AI for internal and external. And now, um, you know, my memory problem with my computer, it turns out both memory sticks are fine. And it's actually the first memory slot that's screwed up. And I went to go log into the motherboard website and my password didn't work. So I reset my password. And I'll tell you guys what the error said after I successfully logged in. It said, system error, please contact system administrator later. System error, please contact system administrator later. That's what it said. <laughs> how, how do you turn that over to an AI? Not to, and how, how would you even power it? Like, there isn't, unless, unless you built a bunch of nuclear power plants, there isn't enough energy on the planet to power the amount of AIs that you would need to run everything. And the users could still just say, no, we don't like this. And then the AI, what's the AI do? Try to rebuild it until they like it. Do you know what that looks like? <laughs> that looks like when you're just trying to, when it's trying to like brute force a picture and keeps putting six fingers on everything, <laughs> six fingers and three joints on everything. And meanwhile, you know how much energy, <laughs> literal energy you're wasting. So it's, it's amazing. It's amazing to me. I think we're headed there, but not anytime soon. I don't think, I don't think there's a way around it, but I think there's more immediate problems like keeping the power grid up at all. Texas just had another big outage. There's all kinds of different bird flus and this flu and that flu and the other flu. I don't see it, unless there's some kind of catalyst, I don't see it getting super bad all of a sudden, and I think that's kind of part of the confusion. There's not a lot of metrics you can look at to readily notice that it's getting incrementally worse. Unless you look at all of the suspicious ways that it's getting better where it shouldn't be. And then you look at the price of houses, the price of food, the price of fuel, um, the debt, <laughs> the national debt, and and if you if you know anything about crypto, like some cryptos that should be doing better that aren't, and other cryptos that are breaking every record ever, um, 
which tells me that the banks are throwing their money into crypto. Uh, oh, and also uh, bank liquidity. You factor all that stuff together. Oh, and, and, the, and the price of vehicles. Those are like hard things that you can measure. Vehicles are coming down, but not very fast. Oh, and look at everybody's income. Income's not going up, but taxes are going up. So day to day, it's kind of hard to tell, but there is a lot of things that you can look at that don't line up. So I don't know how I could be wrong. I don't know how the prices of everything could just come down because we, we, we would have to produce something that would just like make our GDP go crazy. And we just don't, we don't have enough, even if it was AI, we don't have, the grid doesn't have enough power to like power the amount of AI that we would need. And it's going to be years before we can make new chips, new better chips. So we don't have anything to export anymore. So not to mention the border, the massive decline in healthcare availability, climate migration. It's going to be tough. And all the crackdowns on modern defensive tools and, like I said, pickup trucks. Um, I don't know. I guess maybe I'll leave it. I guess maybe I'll leave it there. The only thing we can really do is just keep supporting each other. And so uh, I want to remind everybody, uh, check out Southern Tier Preppers channel. Uh, she was almost to a thousand subs uh, that she needed to monetize, and all of a sudden it like wiped out like 100, 150 subs, something like that. So um, check out her channel to see how, how her uh, recovery is doing. She had a rogue bulldozer go through her house and almost take out her two kids. So, um, Southern Tier Prepper. And then check out uh, Glocktard. He is a, a long time. I'll throw, I'll, I'll throw his link in there. He's only got a couple of videos, but maybe if he is, uh, maybe if he is encouraged, he'll make more videos. But he is like my mentor in a lot of, uh, electricity testing stuff so yeah i mean we gotta just stick together and i know they don't want us to train but you know there's still a lot of good training videos on youtube and even though that's not a supplement for getting out with people you know training with people's i think illegal now so watch those youtube videos and play some, play some uh, airsoft or something if you have to. I don't know. Maybe it depends. Maybe some states it's okay to train with other people, but just be careful and do your due diligence. And if anyone says anything stupid, just steer clear and stay off of Facebook. And the only way we get through this is together so thanks for putting up with the janky recording of this one just this gave me something to do while I was working while my computer is running its tests and stuff so I uh, appreciate y'all and talk to y'all later bye